the reading this morning is taken from Luke 12, verses 32 to 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for the masters to return from a wedding banquet so that when, the, when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. You will make them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready. Even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, we just uh, bring Andrew to you now. We just say thank you for the word that he's prepared for us this morning. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to inspire him as he speaks to us. Amen. to say again what a privilege it is for us to be here and also to share with you this morning. Um, we, we really believe and are persuaded that you here, Christ Church in Bushmead, Luton, have a share in what we're doing in Thailand. And you are, somehow we are an extension of you. We're part of what God is doing in this place that has been sent out. And so I, I hope you feel that. I hope you, you sense that at times. That connection is more than just love and family. It's actually joining in what God is doing in his mission in Thailand. So that's part of why it's a real privilege. And it's very important for us to, to reconnect with you and to have this chance to share. So I, I thank you so much for it. And this morning, as thanks, Steve, for that reading. We're in the book of Luke. We're continuing on uh, Luke 12 from where... David left off last Sunday, and uh, this is an interesting passage, and the title I've put to it is, Don't Be Afraid, Be Ready. Don't be afraid, but do be ready. These words that Jesus spoke in Luke 12 are for us. In fact, all the words of Jesus right throughout the scriptures are timeless. 
they're timeless. And that I mean that they don't change. They're not affected by the passing of time or by changes in fashion or what people think that should be said in the 21st century or by trends. The words of Jesus are timeless. They speak hope into darkness. They bring life where there's death. The words of Jesus bring peace into our troubles. And I think these words in Luke 12 are especially precious and timeless and filled with hope for today. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father, your Father, your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. These days, these times we're living in are times of shaking. We're living through economic shocks. We're living through record-breaking levels of inflation, a global pandemic that is kind of receding but is still with us. War in Europe that we didn't expect. Political upheaval all over the world, not just in this nation. Refugee crises in Europe, in the Middle East, all kinds of other parts of the world. And also increased pressure in society on those who choose to live for Christ. Not only in the nations that we associate that with, like, like China or North Korea, but even places like this, this pressure coming to bear on those who will live according to God's word. And for some of us, for some of you here, that shaking in this season has been profound and personal, not just a theoretical thing. There will be shaking. It's been real. You've passed through shaking. And so into these times, into this climate, Jesus' words ring out, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, little flock. In this case, he was speaking to the disciples but I believe his words, those tender words, are for all of his sheep. He's the good shepherd of all of his sheep. And those words are for us. We too are his flock. In the section that David preached from last week, Jesus addressed some of those fears. The fears that, that were, came up in Luke 12, they were afraid of death. They were afraid of that they didn't matter to God. They were worried about whether or not he would think of them. And he talks about the sparrows. They were afraid of persecution. And he says, when you're persecuted, I'll give you words. Don't worry. They were afraid of not having enough. And he says, I know you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom. They were anxious about food and clothing. Many things that we can relate to. I want to pose this question right as I start this morning. What are the fears that you are facing they may be some like this. They may be quite different. Whatever those fears, they are things that are seeking to steal your peace. And so into those things this morning, Jesus says, don't be afraid. I found this image on, on uh, the internet, and it, it really spoke to me of the posture that I think the good shepherd has with us, his sheep. He's out front He's leading, he knows where he's going, and there is calm and contentment in the flock as they follow him. And we know that sheep are notoriously dull and foolish creatures like us, but there's something in that image where they are following confidently behind the shepherd. And I just want you to rest on that image for a moment and put yourself in that position, following Jesus who is confidently leading out, even in the midst of storm and tumult in our world and in our lives. But the passage doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't stop there. He's addressing fear, but he goes on and he says, the Father has given you the kingdom. Don't be afraid is being linked with this idea that the Father has given us the kingdom. So what does that mean? What does it mean to have received the kingdom and how does it relate to our fears and our concerns? Well, I think it relates directly in that he is saying we should seek first the kingdom. We should seek first the priorities of his righteousness and all the other stuff, the things we're anxious about, 
will be met by the Father. He most definitely cares about all these real concerns that we have. We've just prayed in the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. That is Jesus teaching us to pray about the practical things. So it's not like that is unimportant. They matter to God. In fact, laying our needs before him, as we've just done in our prayers, global needs and local needs and personal needs, that is the way to deal with our worries. Do not be afraid means bring your stuff to me in prayer. But Jesus is also saying something that I think goes beyond that. It pushes beyond that dealing with our needs. He's calling us to be kingdom-minded people, to be kingdom-minded people that our hearts and our priorities are set on his kingdom. People who are not primarily looking for God to make our lives easier or safer or better or happier. He's calling us to make it our priority to live for him and for his kingdom. Let me just say that one more time. Not primarily looking for God to make my life easier or safer or happier. A life with God comes with risk. The Bible says the righteous man or woman will have lots of troubles, but he's there with us in them. It's about being on a journey with God. It's not about being free of worry, free of of things that might concern us. So in the midst of those storms and the tumult and the things that could absorb our, our thoughts, he's calling us to change our priorities. When I was a younger Christian, I thought this meant that the practical things like food and clothing and whatnot didn't matter. They were somehow carnal or fleshly or lesser. They were unimportant and they, they were a distraction, somehow an ungodly distraction. And certainly they can become that. They can become that, and I think Western society, and in fact all societies, are a picture of how in our world we've made all manner of other things our carnal or ungodly focus, and sometimes even idols. It's not just the Buddhists that have idols. It's the people in our nation as well, and even in our own lives. We can get caught up in making these idols things that we trust in, and maybe trying to make them refuges that we hope will protect us in hard times. The obvious ones are things like money and a home and security and a job. But there's all kinds of other things we we can be tempted to trust in. But I think what Jesus is talking about here, it's not really an either-or situation. I don't think it's either the kingdom or these other things. I think it's a question of priority, making the priority of his kingdom Number one, far above all those other needs and priorities which have their place. But the kingdom being far above them. And there are three things here that Jesus touches on that I think are marks of a kingdom priority or descriptions of a kingdom priority. The first one is a sort of a shocking one. Sell everything and care for the poor. For some of us, making God's kingdom, number one, will mean exactly as the passage says, selling everything, selling lots of surplus stuff that we've gathered around us and giving it away to the poor. Maybe God has blessed us abundantly and rather than hoarding it for ourselves, he challenges us to be more generous, to be more thoughtful of those in need. For others of us, What we have may be more limited, more restricted, but we're still challenged by God to give generously, to give sacrificially for the poor and for those in need. The point Jesus is making is not a rule about sell everything. Everybody should be selling everything. We know they did that in the Acts of the Apostles. I don't know that that's meant to be a rule for all time, but it is about the moving of the Spirit that prompts us, all of us, whether we have a lot or little, to be willing to give sacrificially and generously. It's about being spirit-led in that generosity and having a heart that is not living for the possessions we own, for the stuff that, that is ours. So somehow it's having a soft and sensitive heart for those that are in need. And somehow we, 
it's easy to get dulled to those needs. My aunt was visiting with us yesterday, and she reminded us of the orphan crisis after Ceausescu got kicked out in Romania. Do you remember that? About 1991 or two, somewhere in there. It was horrendous. It was on our screens, and lots of people mobilized. And she was telling us it's happening again in Ukraine, a different regime, different scenario. But there are those terrible orphan homes. And I found my compassion fatigue kicking in. Oh, I don't want to hear about another situation that's awful. Having a kingdom priority means staying soft for, towards the needs of the poor and those who are in a desperate plight. During the pandemic, I'm sure many of you here were stretched in that way, needing to care for people who were in dire straits, people who were maybe struggling more than you were, even if all of us were struggling. We found that too in Thailand, and we were challenged as Christians to mobilize ourselves and go out and give food like you saw the kids doing, give food to those who actually were struggling to find something to eat. And survival bags became just a very common thing. It was wonderful seeing the Christians doing that, but actually even the unbelievers were doing it too. I saw lots of Buddhists putting out food in, in little food pantries on the side of the road, and the food would be snapped up within minutes. Somehow for the Christian, it's a challenge that that is to be normative for us, not just in moments of maybe a global pandemic or a crisis in the Ukraine, but all the time, God moving our hearts for those at the margins. Proverbs 19 says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to God. What a thought that we would get the privilege to loan stuff to the king of the universe who has everything. And he says, would you lend what you have to me? Because of course we know that he blesses back as we give to him. It's not just having that compassion when it's fashionable, but always helping, always caring as the Spirit leads. A second mark of kingdom priority is storing up treasure in heaven. I'm pretty sure in heaven it won't look like this, <laughs> even if that looks valuable in earthly terms. I don't really know how it works in God's kingdom. It does say the streets are paved with gold. I think that was John trying to put into language that we would understand the fact that what he saw in his revelation was just mind-blowingly amazing. And so he's using human terms to describe it. I don't know that we'll necessarily be walking on gold because God owns everything. Making God's kingdom number one means we're storing up treasure in a different location. We're not primarily motivated about storing down here. The passage gives one example as care for the poor, but there are all kinds of other ways of storing up divine or heavenly treasure. It might be giving of our time. I know serving here in Christ Church is one of those ways that is a constant challenge. How can I serve and maybe even serving beyond what I would naturally want to. Maybe the things you would enjoy are already covered. Is there something else that can be storing up treasure in God's place? Giving, obviously, in prayer. That's another way we store up treasure in heaven. Giving financially. And for those who have more, that would entail managing those finances so that we can bless even more people. And that's a wonderful privilege for those who've been blessed by God so that you're helped to invest in eternal purposes and things of eternal value. Storing up treasure in heaven means speaking about Christ, about Jesus to others who don't know about him. So we are motivated in the workplace or in our relational context or wherever we are to be those who speak about Jesus, not just be gentle and kind people, but also tell about him. It might be acts of service. It might be acts of love for other people. It will certainly include those things. It might be serving in the life of the church or in other contexts, in outreach, in evangelism. Whatever that setting that God has placed you in, it certainly means bringing his influence, in your sphere of influence, bringing his influence with kingdom intentionality. So that wherever God's placed you, whether it's in a 
home context or in a school or in the workplace or, or in a personal business. We're bringing kingdom intentionality wherever we are. Those are not short-term investments. They are long-term per, per, uh, long permanent investments. They don't fade away as the passage talks about where they might be snapped up by thieves or moths might destroy them. So whether we have a lot or we have little, the question is, are we investing what God has given us for eternity? Are we investing for eternity? And I'm not trying to tell you what that means. With the Holy Spirit, you need to interpret what does eternal investment look like for me? The third way, and this passage talks extensively about it, is being ready for his return. Being ready for his return. I like this image because it shows someone on their way to do business, getting on with the job. A kingdom mindset is one where we remain alert and always ready for his return. But this does not mean that we hunker down in our churches and our Christian fellowship groups and our home groups waiting for the return of Christ and the sudden rapture of all the Christians. Absolutely not. And any book or movie or series that would give us that impression is misleading us. The whole narrative thrust of the Bible and the story of God is that we're a people with a commission to make his glory known here on earth not to be twiddling our thumbs waiting for his return. When I was a younger Christian, maybe in my earlier teens, there was a mistaken view going around, and I picked it up. I don't remember how. It seemed like Christians around me were simply hanging on in the expectation that Jesus was coming in the next probably three to five decades. And then it would all be over, and we'd get whisked away. Well, 30 years has passed, and... Um, Jesus hasn't come yet, and there's still at least one nation with only 1% Christian. I'm not trying to figure out when Jesus is returning, but it seems to me there's still a lot of work to be done. It could be that there's still hundreds of years before he returns. The point is, whether it's tomorrow or 500 years from now, how ought we to live? How ought we to live while we wait for his return? I thought it was powerful that Wendy posed that question. What if Jesus was coming tomorrow? Well, we ought to live urgently getting on with the business of the kingdom. That investment into that which will not uh, rust or fade or be stolen. It could be that Jesus doesn't come for a long time. It could be that he comes very soon. It is clear that all through the ages, Christians have believed his return is just around the corner. And we're still here today. I don't propose to put a seed of disappointment or resentment in our hearts about the delay of his return. Quite the contrary. I think he's given us commission, the great commission, and other lesser commissions, accompanying commissions, that are still as compelling and urgent as ever. And I don't say that just because we are missionaries in a foreign land. It is true for every single person who has made Jesus Lord. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, Matthew 28 says. All the nations. They've come here to Luton in great numbers, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So we've been given a job to do. And it's not a small job. It's not just for Sundays and a few other little bits and pieces here and there. It's a massive job of bringing the good news to individuals and families and communities up and down this country and around the world. It's a job of bringing the ways and the wisdom of God to bear in all of the areas of his broken and hurting world. So wherever God's planted you, there is great commission work to be done. One day... He will renew it all. We know the end of the story. It's, it's there for us. And he will renew it. There will be a new kingdom and a new earth. But until then, he's asking us, like the man in the image, to get on with the business at hand. 
And so these moments here in church are, are a training ground for the stuff that we're to do out there. Bringing his kingdom out as it is in heaven into the earth. So as I found when I was in my teens, the tendency for Christians was to keep their eye on the exit and to sort of be wondering, well, is he coming? How soon can I get out of here? Uh, I think we need to shift our, our view away from the exit. He, he will come. And I hope we won't so much be ambushed as be ready. But we diligently get on with the stuff that he would want to find us doing if he showed up at a moment's notice. We'd be found serving him, loving him, eagerly storing up treasure that is heavenly and not stuff that is fading away and not of eternal value. So may God by his spirit help us to live that way in Luton and also for us in Chiang Mai. Amen. And would you all like to stand as we go into...